Which do you prefer to use on your milling machine clamping system? Hex nuts with thick washers or flange nuts with a built-in washer? I know I prefer a flange nut. Let's make some today. Howdy once again, it's Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher at your service. Let's make some of these flange nuts today and I'll make three different sizes and I will make uh, them by three different methods of uh, producing the hexagon starting with round stock of course and you're going to see flange nuts used quite a bit in products that you assemble in your home because it eliminates a washer matter of fact there's a flat washer and really a lock washer all in one now these little nuts are stamped nuts we're going to machine larger nuts most specifically on your milling machines you'll probably use the 5 8 diameter thread on uh, bridge ports this is possibly made of heat treated steel I'm not even going to double check I do like the appearance of this I like the coloring I like everything about it and you certainly can buy these from any machine shop supplier I don't think you'll find them at a local hardware store but just for the fun of it let's make some first of all let me tell you what not to do in the early days of my teaching we had a very low budget like a B Western and you know we couldn't buy things like uh, like nuts uh, like that so we would make our own and I didn't have a dividing head or any real means of doing it at that time so I simply took a piece of hexagon stock about this size this of course is a wooden mock-up and I had a stud either pinned or welted in there I forgot which and we would screw the blank on there pretend that this is still a piece of round stock and this could be put in the milling machine vise and we would first mill one side then unclamp it rotate it by one sixth mill the other side and so on times six and this was a good method if the boys would actually listen to you and follow instructions but if they uh, entered with the milling cutter from the wrong way it would instantly unscrew this no matter how tight you had it and break the cutter and flip that across the room until it hit the metal walls you know and I can still hear that happening I'm not sure if it was the cutter that hit the wall or the nut but they would really go flying so I had to put the kibosh to that after about a year don't try that at home as far as the dimensions of the nut are concerned I could find nothing about them in this 30th edition here of the machinery handbook but in this wonderful little black book the fastener version of it remember there's about three or four different versions of this there are complete dimensions for this and I'll put a still of that near the end of the video you can never have enough flange nuts around the shop and as you can see from these two sets that I have this is 3 8 and this is half that in most cases the flange nuts are missing there's a few there in the smaller size but here I don't know where they are I bought these used so maybe they were missing when I bought them but uh, they get spread around the shop on different fixtures I have prepared some material here for this project and in the smaller size which is 3 8 thread the wrench that is to be used is in 11 16 in the half inch 13 size the wrench to be used is 7 8 and then the most common for 5 8 11 is 1 and 1 16th and that's probably what you're using on your Bridgeport mill you can of course use any size material you want but according to the specs in the black book the 3 8 size requires 15 16 material the half inch 13 requires 1 and 1 8 and the 5 8 11 requires 1 and 3 8 now I had some 15 16 in stock I did not have 1 and 1 8 so I turned down a piece I did not have 1 and 3 8 so I turned down a piece note that these pieces are short because of the way I'm going to hold them this piece can be longer because it will be held in a collet 
Again, 11 16 across the flats for this 3 8 size. And the overall thickness here is just a little bit over half. And the thickness of the washer is, let's call it, one eighth. You can do your layout ahead of time like this, or simply do it on the milling machine by dialing it in. Either one is good enough. Okay, for the 3 8 size, I'm going to use this little hardinge divider. I'm not sure exactly what to call this. Maybe a super spacer or something like that. It holds 5C collets and I already have a 15 16 collet installed with a little drawbar. And we can divide, not like a full blown dividing head, but there's a protractor on here and I've already marked it because we need to space it uh, six times. We're making a hexagon is what we're making. So I've got these all marked. Perhaps you can see the name Hardinge on there. And I don't believe I've ever used this since I've owned it. And I think it's fairly old. So before I clamp it on the milling machine, let me go ahead and put the stock in there and I'll be fairly close to the collet and I'll tighten this down. That can be done simply with a punch because these holes go all the way through or a spanner wrench. I've taken the liberty simply with a black marker to mark the six spots and in this particular device this little lever here goes into a hole. Perhaps you can hear it click in now. So I'll go clear around and do that but I have noticed that I need to hold this. There's no way of locking it or tightening it, so I will be holding this so it can't pop out, which is a possibility, I think, as I make my cut, which causes some vibration. And I'll just use a half-inch milling cutter, no big deal. I am fully aware that there may not be another machinist in all of Christendom that has a hardinge super spacer, or whatever we call this, but many of you will have one of these little... Uh, index devices and these are quite cheap and that could be used and the principle will be almost exactly the same. And I will tighten the drawbar. Like that and it's not going to go any place. Now there's two ways to do this. I could touch off or I could use an edge finder or simply move this in until the cutter lines up with the layout line and that's the way I'm going to do it because this just isn't all that critical but you can suit yourself on that so that's how you make one location and if you do the math you'll realize that this is 1 8 inch deep and uh, so I'll touch off with the cutter and then just raise the table by 125 thousandths simple enough and lock the table in the x-axis. And that's all there is to it. And the wrench fits just fine. This dimension should be .688 or thereabouts. So I'm within four thousands and there's quite a bit of leeway on that if you look in the little black book. All right, the work is held in a three-jaw chuck, and I'm going to file a nice uh, bevel or chamfer or crown on there. 
Now you ought to do this left-handed for safety, but I simply can't do a thing with my left hand. And now the nut is uh, screwed onto a 3 8 bolt that is held in the chuck jaws. And I'll face it to length or down to the line. Okay, that turned out quite nicely using the little hardinge fixture or you could use your spin index you can change any dimensions you want if you want the flange to be a little thicker or a little thinner or you want the nut to be taller but uh, this is the same dimensions as the black book calls for and the sample here you also can blue it with gun blue or do anything you want to it just leave it the, the way it is now as I do the larger sizes the half and the 5 eighths, I do not intend to show the drilling and tapping and cutting off. All right, let's move on to the next size, which is one half inch. Okay, in this part of the video, I'm going to make the half inch thread flange nut using this blank. Remember, that's one and one eighth diameter. I have already put some layout lines on there, and they sure don't show up very well, do they? And this will be held in the three jaw chuck of this hardinge four to one ratio dividing head or index head. So I got to talk just a little bit about how to do the dividing on this. And then since you will not have a four to one, that's kind of an orphan. If you do have a dividing head, it's probably a 40 to one. So I'll go through that real, real briefly. With the hardinge head now, 4 to 1 ratio and we're going to divide six sides so that's just six divisions is all it is so the formula if you want to call it a formula is just 4 over 6 I have four different plates for the hardened dividing head three I just showed you and one already on there and the one that's already mounted is plate number one with those holes. I just as soon use that plate but I would be able to use other plates as well but I'm going to use the one because uh, the 18 hole circle is what I'm going to use and I'll show you why. The value of a fraction does not change if you multiply both the numerator and denominator by a number. For instance if I multiply uh, 4 times 2 and 6 times 2, we, we simply have, what, 8 over 12. Well, there is no plate with 12 holes. So let's uh, multiply it again, this time by 3. So that would give me, what, 12 over 18. Remember, all of these fractions here have the same value. So I will use plate number one with 18 holes and I will have to move uh, I know I'm stammering here a little bit 12 holes on the 18 hole circle for each side of the hexagon most of you will have a dividing head different brands 40 to 1 ratio seems to be the standard I sold my big Cincinnati dividing head because the only way to move it was with a bobcat. So the formula, if you want to call it one, is 40 over 6. And if we divide that out, that equals to 6 and 4 sixths 
turns for each side of the hexagon. I'm pretty sure you would have a, a plate that has 24 holes. As we know, there's none with 6. So if we multiply the top and the bottom times 4, we have 6 and 16 24. So if you are using a plate with 24 holes, you would turn it 6 and 16 24 for each side of the hexagon. Is that clear as mud at all? The crank is set so that the pin will drop into the hole circle that I just mentioned that has 18 holes. And I've set the sector here for nine holes. So here's what I'll be doing. For each division, I will turn it like this, nine spaces. The 4 to 1 ratio is very fast acting compared to that 41. So that's all I'm doing. And then I would move this like this after I make my cut and right there I'd be ready for the next cut. That's all there is to it. This is really simple to use. Now let me go ahead and set this up on the bridge board. I won't show that. Alright, here is the setup. The dividing head is mounted to the table of the milling machine by two T-bolts. That's a three-quarter cutter and I've already located it. I'm not going to show that because I showed that in the earlier part and it's basically the same but there's one-eighth of an inch depth of cut and as far as the x-axis I just line the cutter up with the layout line. The plate is on zero and ready to cut and I do lock this with this little wrench here each time I make a cut. So there's just six cuts to make. Let's see how it goes. Okay, I managed to lose the footage for that first <laughs> for the first two spots but I think it'll be all right. Unlock this. Sorry about that. Let's see if the wrench fits. Nice fit. Ready to take out. Well, that cutter was a bit dull after all and left horrendous burrs. But into the lathe it goes for uh, deburring, drilling, tapping, and then cutting off. Again, I won't show that. I'll be back through the magic of television almost instantly with it finished. You see, I told you it would only take a minute or less. You know, uh, when you try to power tap with a uh, tap like this, they typically slip on you in the Jacobs chuck because it's hardened. It just cannot get a grip. But the nut is done. So I did have to do some hand tapping. I guess that's where I was going with that. Looks pretty good. And again, that's the half 13. Okay, that's what we got so far. This is the one I just finished. It's still warm. Fits just nice. Finish is pretty decent, although it's not important. You can do as much or as little as you want with the finish. 
Now I have a couple irrelevant questions. Would I be considered anal in that I have to wipe off and clean my drill bits when I, before I return them? Now here's one that's dirty. Somebody else must have used it. It really bothers me. And the other thing is I have talked about this kind of candy cane type nut tap before. Are you familiar with it? The beauty of this type of tap it's used in production and it's a continuous thing that the nuts is strictly for nuts run right through here one right after the other and they do not have to back up eventually a whole row of them here drop off. I've talked about that before haven't I? These are nut taps. Okay I'm quitting for the day even though this is just a 15 minute video so far I spent the whole day on it believe it or not. A lot of setups you know. And I'm gonna take a little rest watch a bee western and tomorrow tackle this in the same video. That's the 5 8 one the most important one to be made out of this slug and I will do that on the rotary table so see you in a few minutes. Well I'm back and it's a new day and this is the third part of the video. I've already made a 3 8 and a half inch flange nut and today we'll tackle the 5 8 the largest of the three and again here is my stock 1 and 3 8 diameter and I have already marked it using the height gauge. I just as soon go from layout lines because it isn't that critical. The overall thickness here according to the sample is 816 thousandths with a 200 thousandth washer and the balance there is 616 thousandths so that's ready to go. Now this will be using the rotary table and the way I'm doing it here really your blank here has to be relatively short so there's a lot of waste stock when you do these methods and if you had to buy this material I just had it on the shelf. It would cost you more than what the nut would cost. I suppose these are three or four or five dollars a piece at the most and are case hardened, a quality product. So what, what we're doing here isn't really that practical. It's just fun to do and, uh, and useful if you do have the material on hand. But some of you are just watching this for the pure pleasure, I hope. Is everybody happy? I'm at the Bridgeport Mill and this is the Walther rotary table which is 250 millimeter made in Germany you know which is about 10 inch so this setup here is over an hour so and it's fun to do but it's not something you can do real quickly and I showed this in a very recent video when I did index plates and I showed you how to uh, indicate this in so that's already done and it's been shown in several of my videos so I will not dwell on that. But that's the very first thing you have to do and then clamp it down firmly and you will notice that I'm using the peat blocks. So the center of the Bridgeport spindle is perfectly on center with the rotary table. But let me digress just a moment here now. The original owner of this rotary table was Bubba. It's probably had several other owners, but uh, he's very strong-armed and uh, ignorant as well. So you can see it's broken out in several places. Now that's not only because he was a very strong man, but what can happen if you're using the wrong kind of T-nuts where the stud can go all the way through like that, what can happen is that it literally jacks itself up and breaks out the castings probably more likely that, that that has happened than just uh, t tightening the work down. I do not know that for sure but be very careful it doesn't happen to you. Most of the T-nuts are staked so the stud can only go in so far. Let's get back to the business at hand. Well next how are we going to hold the work onto the rotary table? Well I'm going to use a three jaw chuck. There are probably other ways of doing it but now the three jaw chuck itself has to be centered also with the spindle and the center of the rotary table. So I do that just by a simple method here. It's probably only semi-accurate of bringing a stud down 
tightening the chuck and then putting the clamps on and I won't show that all because that's really kind of irrelevant to this. I don't want to spend too much time showing the setup. I've already spent too much time. Okay, there's what the final setup looks like. Now since this is a rotary table and I will be milling a hexagon, I'm not going to do it with the wheel. That's disconnected. I'm just going to rotate this by the protractor for the six different sides. Let me zoom in on that. Okay, zooming in on the protractor now, there's the zero mark. So I'll take my first cut at zero, then unlock the table. I'll lock it during each cut and move it to 60 degrees, lock it, move it to 120, and then 180, 240, and 300. I'll show you that on my little cheat sheet. And there it is, of course, each side of a hexagon is 60 degrees to the next one. Alright, I still have to locate the cutter in relationship to the work, and it's still on center, of course. Now, you can take the cutter out and put an edge finder and find the edge, but that's just one other step. It can be do math, done mathematically by moving the table, the radius of the cutter, plus the radius of the work, and that is... 1.062 that's 1 and 1 16th of an inch so I'm going to move it out and I'm watching the digital readout which of course you cannot see and there I am at 1.602 and I'm right on the edge of the work and now I'll move the quill down or the table up it doesn't matter 616 thousandths, that's that dimension there, but I'm just going by the layout line. You could dial it in if you want and then lock the quill. Boy, there's a lot of steps, aren't there? Okay, the depth this way, moving in here, is 156 thousandths. I'm going to take that in two passes. So 100 and then uh, that'd be the roughing and then another 56 on the finishing. So you'll see me moving it here. 100 thousandths right there locking the table in the X direction I don't want to climb mill here I question the rigidity a little bit of this setup because I got these spindly little screws here and I don't want it to spin around so I'm ready to finally cut here on side one Okay, that's the preliminary rough cut, and it looks pretty good. I've returned the rotary table to zero degrees, and I've increased that depth of cut, so now I'm at 156 thousandths. I'm going to go around to the six sides again. Here we go.
and it fits perfectly and I'm ready to take it out of the chuck. Let's go to the bench. Well there it is, ready to be drilled, tapped, cut off, and faced. And I will do all of that off camera. The video is so long already and uh, I am pleased with it. Let me point out that the hole could have been drilled and tapped ahead of time and then just cut off. You know, there's different orders of operation here. I'm just trying to stay consistent with what I've been doing. All right, be back in a few minutes. Well, there it is, the finished nut. And that was a pretty big job, really, just to make one nut because of all the setups. There was a 17 30 seconds hole tapped with a 5 8 11 Unified National Course tap. It would be ready to use. And there it is with the others. Before I close, just one other thing. I talked about this earlier in the video, my homemade jig, certainly made out of steel, not out of maple like this one, but that was just a teaching aid, which I wasted 30 minutes out of my life making, by the way. But a uh, collet block like this, hexagon could certainly be used in the milling machine vise with a larger collet, of course, and you'd probably be limited up to the size maybe of half inch, but that's probably the easy way to go, especially compared to using the rotary table. Well, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Three different ways to produce flange nuts for your machine shop. This is Mr. Pete saying so long for now, and I'll see you next time.